Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'm Father Chris here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and it's an honor to have you with us again for explaining the faith. And today's topic is one I have been asked to do for years. I haven't, and today we're going to do it. And that is a talk on the church scandal. And this is the reality that we need to be aware of in both truth and myth. And so I've done a lot of work on this as provincial superior. I have to know the laws. We worked over our presidium, our own guidelines, and we have to be very careful when anything comes up. So I feel it's a topic that I can speak with some authority on, and we want to share with you how the church, what's happened and how it's been handled. And so this is one thing they did not teach in seminary, but I had to learn uh, being provincial. So let us begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you send the Holy Spirit down upon us to bless our people watching, especially bless any victims of abuse within the church, of any abuse of any kind, but especially within the church. No excuse, Lord. Help heal us. Um, help, help to bring us back into your mercy rather than to um, be guilty of, of not living a life of faithfulness. And we ask, Mother Mary, that you wrap your mantle around us and you guide us and lead us. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so you see from the, um, the first slide <clears throat> that we're talking about the church scandal, but I'm going to present this from both sides. I, I am going to present what has happened and we know is fact of what is guilt. And then we're going to talk about some myth and false accusations. So please don't get angry. Please hear the whole talk. Um, you know, a lot of times I get the comments and people chewing me out, and I always say, did you watch the whole talk? Because usually we'll get to understanding the whole picture. All right, now, nobody doubts that terrible sins and crimes have been committed by the clergy. In fact, priests have been committing sin going all the way back to the Old Testament. This is nothing new. And it's condemned by the Catholic faith, it's condemned by church law. However, many in our church leadership haven't held the clergy and the religious accountable to the standards set by this Catholic faith of ours, by our Catholic law. And so there are, the, and you know, and scandals, today we're going to be talking about scandal. It's not just sex abuse. There's scandal of privacy violations, discrimination, um, uh, consensual affairs. These are, there's many types of scandal, and we're going to touch on that today. Now, let's start with just a couple that we know are recent and that need prayer. These are real. These are not fabricated. Let's start with one right now, the Bishop of Fort Worth and 10 cloistered nuns in Arlington, Texas that have been at odds. If you heard this story, pray for the, everybody involved. The head of this Carmelite convent, Mother Teresa Agnes Gerlach, had a seizure last year. And when she was medicated, she's in a wheelchair. But when she was medicated, she admitted to committing online sexual sin with a priest, breaking her vows. Um, let's, take our, let's go to our next slide. Now, this was reported to Bishop Michael Olson. So on the left, you have Mother Teresa Agnes, and on the right is Bishop Michael Olson. They're going at it in the media. I'm not reporting anything secretive. We need prayers here. This is tearing the church apart. And so the information was given to Bishop Michael Olson, and he began basically what was described as a crusade against the nuns, quote, in the report, interrogating them and confiscating all of their stuff. Now, I'm not taking sides here. I do not know enough about this. All I know is it's all over the news. <clears throat> Soon the nuns refused to cooperate, 
claiming that Olson, the bishop, was traumatizing them. And so things escalated, and Bishop Olson threatened to dismiss the nuns from the Carmelite order. And then the nuns turned around and sued the bishop for violating their privacy and defamation of character. What's going on in the church today? This is just one current example of a, of a scandal. So the nun's lawyer called the police to investigate Olson, Bishop Olson. The Bishop Olson, in return, released photos that were taken by, quote, a confidential informant taken at the convent showing marijuana edibles, an alcohol bong, and drug paraphernalia. Now the nuns claim that this photo was fake and it was staged and that Olson was trying to shut the monastery down to seize their property. Again, I'm not taking sides here. I don't know any of those involved. I've not been there. I don't know the story. I'm just telling you, this is what people see from the outside of the Catholic Church. Or how about this one? Let's go to our next slide. In April of this year, Maryland's Attorney General released a report outlining the sexual abuse of youth over six decades in the Archdiocese of Baltimore. Now, the New York Times reported this, and this was a large 463-page report, which you see on your screen, identifying 156 abusers connected to the church. Now, mostly were priests, not all, who abused more than 600 youth going back to the 1940s. The report illustrates, quote, the depraved systematic failure of the archdiocese to protect the most vulnerable, the children, and that they were charged to keep safe. This is according to Attorney General Anthony Brown. Now, I know Bishop Lori, Archbishop Lori, the head of the Baltimore Diocese, you know, that's the oldest diocese in the United States. Um, he said in a statement, quote, the pain and destruction that was perpetrated by representatives of the church and perpetrated by the failures that allowed this evil to fester, I am deeply sorry. I mean, what else can the bishop say? You know, meeting with the victims. And if you are a victim, if you have been harmed in any way, there is nothing that we can tell you that it just makes it go away. No, it doesn't. The church has to and has owned up to this. What you're going to hear from me throughout this talk is what the church is doing. Now, it doesn't erase the past, but, but we, we, we want to guarantee that the, especially the youth are protected in the future. I can't change the past, but I can make sure that our Miriam priests are protecting the children today. And if you are a victim, there is no excuse. And I'm not going to give excuses. But at the same time, there are priests who are victims. There's one right up there in jail uh, north of us that refuses to admit, and he's been cleared just basically almost every, every piece of evidence, but he will not admit the plea bargain, and he stays in jail. So everybody seems to take sides here, and it's so difficult. It's so difficult. And so what happened here in, in uh, Baltimore is Monsignor Jeffrey Burrell. He's the Secretary General of the USCCB. Um, this is another story. I'm sorry, this is not the Baltimore. This is another one. Jeffrey Burrell, Monsignor, the Secretary General of the USCCB. This is public. I'm not giving you any private information. Was forced to resign from his position back in 2021 because he was found to have do downloaded the gay dating app Grindr and was frequently visiting gay bars. This is not what we need in the leadership of our church. All right, let's go on to the next one. Next slide. You all probably recognize this is Cardinal McCarrick. All right, the Vatican expelled this U.S. Cardinal from the priesthood in 2019 for sexually abusing minors. 
In 2021, he was officially charged here in Massachusetts with sexually assaulting a 16-year-old boy in the 1970s, making him the highest ranking Catholic official in the US ever to face criminal charges in the clergy sex abuse scandal. However, he's now 93 or 94, and now in August of this year, so just last month, you may have seen this on the news, I was reading the articles last night, um, charges were dismissed because of the age-related incompetence. Now, please note, these were not charges dismissed by the church. Uh, people are going to get angry, saying, there, yo, there's the church again, letting them go. No, it was not dismissed by the church. The church handed it over. The charges were dismissed by the courts. And they said that he was too old and incompetent to face trial. And the judge determined he was not mentally fit. So this is not the church. Now, the victim's lawyer, Mitchell Garabadian, said, quote, in spite of the criminal court's decision today, many clergy sex abuse victims feel as though former Cardinal Theodore McCarrick is and will always be permitted permanent personification of evil in the Catholic Church. Mm. Wow. Pray. Pray for our situation. Let's go to the next one. I'm just giving you some of the most recent. There's many cases, but I'm just giving you the most recent. This is Slovenian priest, so it's not just in America. This is a picture of Slovenian priest Marko Rupnik, who's been all over the news. He was expelled from the Jesuits just this past June for, quote, sexually, spiritually, and psychologically abusing women, especially nuns, for decades. The Associated Press reported this. Now, however, he's a famous Catholic mosaic artist whose work was done and hanging in the churches for the Year of Mercy and others. We had, we had the, the painting that he did. We didn't know any of this. And so they were in chapels all over the world, and this, this created a debate that his art should be removed or should people be separated from the art? The art should be separate from the artist because art speaks for itself. Um, just like Father Patrick Briscoe said from our Sunday visitor, he said, no, leave the art, separate it from the artist. This is the debate. And um, he says, otherwise, if we say anything else, we can see that art is ideological. It's not. Now, the victims of his abuse are calling for the art to be removed. Now, his artwork, this is a quote from one of the victims, his artwork should be removed as a testimony to the entire church and as a witness that there are consequences for abuse. Wow. All right, just a couple more. Let's go to our next one. This is a big one. There are a lot of examples. This is one of the worst, the founder of the Legionnaires of Christ. I almost joined them. I didn't know anything about this. But Marcio uh, Michele, Michael was abusing over 60 minors and fathered children living a double life. Wow. This is crazy. The New York Attorney General in New York, in Buffalo, has sued the Buffalo Diocese and two former bishops for cover-ups. Hmm. It's not just in the U.S. Chile, Ireland, Australia, France, Portugal, all around the world have dealt with scandal. Nationwide here in the U.S., we've had 17,000 complaints against the church. 17,000. The church has paid out in the U.S. $4 billion since the 1980s. And that figure could go way up because now they're given more time to go back, eliminating the statutes of limitations. So nobody is denying. Why did I start with this? Okay, I started with this because I want to show you that nobody is denying that the scandal isn't real and it isn't dangerous and treacherous and devastating. 
most of all to the victims, not just to the church. The church is bringing this upon herself, needs to be fixed. These priests have got to be removed, not just priests, brothers, laity that are working in the church. It's got to be dealt with. It's, it, they're, they're, nobody is arguing this. And we cannot continue to stress, or I, I should say, I, I, I must continue to stress, I cannot stress enough how we need to pray for the victims and help them. There is no doubt about that. There's nothing I can say to take away your pain if you are a victim. I'm upset, though, for two reasons when I was putting this all together. One is I have anger at the guilty because Our Lady said in many apparitions that the, the guilty priests were going to create a lot of trouble for the priests who were trying to be faithful. I'm not claiming to be a faithful priest, but I am trying. I'm not virtue signaling. I'm not trying to say, look at their sins, and I'm trying, I'm a good priest. No, I, I, I'm not a faithful priest when it comes to doing everything right. No, but I'm trying to be. And so Mary warned that these abuse cases were going to make things very difficult. And I, I see it every time I go to the airport. I'm leaving to the airport in, in an hour and a half. I'm flying to Vancouver. Every time I go into the airport, I pray. Because I, something always happens, good or bad. I've been asked to hear confessions. I've had people join me for mass when I did mass at a Chick-fil-A table because my flight was delayed and I wasn't going to get home till after midnight. I've also had people stop me, call me pedophile, block me in the way trying to get to my flight. So wearing the collar in the airport is definitely an adventure. But... I, I, putting this together, I'm angry at both sides. Those who are guilty and those who label all priests as guilty. Just because there are some guilty priests doesn't mean all priests are guilty. I'm guilty of a lot of stuff. But I would rather die before I would harm a child. Now, there are a lot of issues now, one of the biggest issues has become pedophilia. Nobody in our culture would say this is acceptable. Nobody. But it's not always been the case. You know, it was a normal part of the ancient Greek and Greco-Roman world. Let's go to our next slide. In Greece and Rome, pedophilia was common. Homosexuality. It was commonplace for men to have sexual relations with boys 12 to 18. Ironically, that's the exact same age as what the scandal, most all of the scandal is, 12 to 18. Then Christ came, changed everything. After him, Christianity rejected this pagan practice of pedophilia as a distortion of sexuality. The only reason there are laws against it today is because of the evangelization efforts of the Catholic Church. It was Christ and then the church that followed him that pointed out this is wrong. In Greece and Rome, it was common. As Christianity evangelized the pagan world, the acceptance of pedophilia greatly diminished. It was replaced by widespread moral law, moral awareness, and then anti-pedophilia laws came onto the books because of the church. The same is true for homosexuality, slavery, abortion, euthanasia. Oh, well, Father, the church supported slavery. You got to hear one of my talks I did in my homily a few weeks ago. You should see the church documents condemning slavery from the very beginning. Yeah, there were some bad priests, just like there is in the scandal, that even owned slaves. That doesn't mean the church embraced it. The church condemned it. And there were some mistakes made, absolutely. Whole nother topic. But there became, <clears throat> these became moral issues rather than accepted pagan practices because of the church. So it's ironic that the church is accused of being the root of all evil and being immoral when it was the one who set the moral standard. Now again, that was a while ago. 
and the church has lost her way in many facets. Now, this has happened because many in the church have lost their way and turned to sin. We are losing our morality because we're losing our Christian roots. We are redefining sexual relations. Now, every, anything goes. Two, some, three, some, same sex, animals, everything. It's crazy. We've redefined marriage. We've put abortion into law. All this is because of the de-Christianization of our culture. Now, some priests, bishops, and even cardinals are at the heart of the problem, the heart of the Catholic Church, and they're acting as willing agents of this new paganism, undoing 2,000 years of Christian tradition. There's an uproar of a current priest out there now teaching that homosexual relations are okay. And he's allowed to do it. Baffling. What are the stats? All right, here's some interesting things. You know, the John Jay study, very thorough, found that 81% of the victims are male. Okay, now let's think about this. 81% of the abuse victims in the church are male. 78% of those were after puberty. Still minors, so that 12 to 18 range again, just like Greece. Now, if 100% of the perpetrators, now we're talking about the perpetrators, are male, because we're talking only about priests here. So 100% of the perpetrators are male, and 80% of the victims are male, and 80% of that 80% is post-puberty, we have an issue that is homosexual. It's a homosexual problem, not a pedophilia problem. Now, does that mean there's not some pedophilia? Yes, there are. But most of the victims are post-pubescent. The problem is homosexuality. Do you know how many priests as percentage are abusers of any kind? Post-puberty or pre-puberty, 4%. Too many, unacceptable, unexcusable. But here's what the John Jay report found. Let's go to our next slide. Out of a study of 4,300 priest offenders, so they studied 4,329 priest offenders, 96 were pedophiles. Okay, that's 2%. So 2% of the abusers are pedophiles. All the rest were post-puberty, male-to-male, homosexual. Now, it's not acceptable because that's called aphibophilia. So the problem in the church, which you've probably never heard, am I saying there's not a problem? No. There is definitely a problem. But the problem is called aphibophilia, not pedophilia. Does that not mean there's a couple pedophiles? pedophiles? Yes, there are. But that's 2%. Still wrong. One is wrong. But 98% is a febophilia. A minor past puberty. Just like Greece and Rome. Pagan. Bishop Merlino, God rest his soul, Madison, Wisconsin, does not des deny the presence of some pedophile priests but says, quote, the problem is actually a febophilia because a vast majority of abusers were past puberty minors, not pedophilia. The percentage is less than teachers and way less than the general population. It's half. The general population that is ped pedophilias, according to all the studies, is 4%. It's double the Catholic priest. Now, is that excusing the Catholic priest? Absolutely not. What about celibacy? This problem wouldn't happen if the church, which is backwards, would allow the priest to marry. False. Almost all sex offenders are not celibate, either priest or laity. I'm sorry, the, of the laity. I apologize. Of course the priests are. They are married 
Many are TV evangelists, well-known people. You know, there's a, a doctor that studies this. His name is Dr. Fitzgibbons. And he said, quote, in treating priests who have engaged in these acts, we have observed that these men almost always, without exception, suffered from a denial of sin in their lives. So you want to know what the problem is? Let's go back to the priest now. Denial. Not thinking a sin is a sin. He said these priests rejected the church teaching on sexual morality. We have to hold these priests accountable. We can't solve this sickness, he said, without a proper diagnosis. And he said the proper diagnosis is found in the Bible. You remain chaste. They don't examine their consciences or accept the church's teaching on moral issues. I'm talking about the priests now. Of any abuse, whether it's pedophilia or a febophilia or adult. Like Father Ripnick, who was adult nuns. So whether it's children, adolescents, or adults, it's wrong. And they don't examine their consciences. They don't accept the church teaching. Many don't even realize, he said, the incredible gift of confession. You know, I never believed that until I was overseas in a foreign country and I was hearing the confessions of the priests. Several of the priests hadn't been to confession in years. The only reason I think some of them went to confession is because I gave a talk on confession and really, really stressed the importance and the need and that we will lose our priesthood without it. And all of a sudden the line was long of these priests. Several of them came to me that had not been to confession for years. My goodness, I go every week <laughs> because we need it. If you do this, meaning your will over the teaching of the church, you will lose the spiritual battle. So the, the scandal is demonic. Bishop Barron said, those who have fallen into scandal are the ones who took their mind off the fight, like David. We are consumed by the need for pleasure, like David. He called these priests Davids. What did David do? Remember the Old Testament? The battle's raging. He's taking his siesta up on the balcony. Then he sees Bathsheba bathing, calls her up, has relations with her. The whole time the battle is raging. David is after his pleasure. So this is what Bishop Barron said. These Davids should have been out fighting, fighting for souls. Instead, they were napping and seeking pleasure, not caring for the sheep, but rather abusing their sheep for their own pleasure. Scary. Wealth, pleasure, power, this can all overtake us if we aren't careful. Please pray for these souls. You know, we always hear about praying for the victims, and that's good, we should. But how many of you are praying for the priests? Their souls are the ones in most jeopardy. As much as I pray for the victims, and we should, and I do, have you remembered to pray for the priests? Their souls are the souls in most need of prayer. They're the ones closest to hell. I am very upset with these priests, but I can look in the mirror and find a million mistakes I've made. Not with children, but everything else. So we need prayer. I'm also upset with those who have falsely accused good priests. I bet you've not heard this. Let's go to our next slide. This is the former head of the grand jury of Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania grand jury, now governor of Pennsylvania, Josh Shapiro. I have to bite my tongue on what I'm about to share. Because the Pennsylvania grand jury was very interesting. It was led by this Josh Shapiro, and it made two distinct charges. The first one concerns predator priests and their victims and their unspeakable acts. Appalling as that is, it's the second one that had more reverberations. 
He said, all of these victims were brushed aside in every part of the state by church leaders who preferred to protect the abusers and their institutions above the victims. Quote, priests were raping little boys and girls and the men of God who were responsible for them not only did nothing, they hid it all, end quote. I would like to address this issue and this claim. And all this information is public knowledge. First of all, let's go to our next slide. Is the Pennsylvania grand jury report misleading? You better believe it is. Am I saying there's not victims? No, of course there are sexual victims. But grand juries are not a jury. This is the first thing nobody tells you. A grand jury is not a jury. It's the most misnomer of anything that I have seen. There are no cross-examinations, no legal due process. What is the purpose then? The purpose is not to determine guilt or innocence. That is not the purpose of a grand jury. In fact, I'm working with Father Kaz with the grand jury here in Massachusetts because they've come to every single religious edu uh, community in the state and they want files on everyone that there's even been any accusation, credible or uncre uh, uncredible. And so we had to go back 50 years and supply data. So I'm working with the grand jury here in Massachusetts. And the first thing is the grand jury does not determine guilt or innocence, but only whether or not there is sufficient grounds to bring an indictment to trial. The trial is where guilt or innocence is determined, not the grand jury. And in the Pennsylvania case, they made themselves judge, jury, and executioner. Why do I say this? Because most priests that are in their list were dead and never had a chance to defend themselves. So what was Josh Shapiro's motives for spending millions of taxpayer dollars and resources when all, almost all the priests were dead or removed from ministry? There were almost no recent cases. He admitted Josh Shapiro admitted that no convictions could come of it because the cases were too old. The priests were dead or left ministry or were kicked out. It is not to help the public. In fact, one of their cases, the guy was born in 1896. That was one of the cases they discussed. So they're either dead or thrown out of the priesthood. So what's the point of causing such euphoria? Why didn't he investigate the public schools or the Boy Scouts, which have much, much, much higher rates? We don't know, but here's what he said. And I'm quoting him, 300 predator, predator pedophile priests. That's a lie. Many are non-priests and laity that worked for the church. During the seven decades under the investigation by this grand jury, there were over 5,000 priests in the state. So the percent of priests that had an accusation against them was actually only 3%. Still wrong. But of that 3%, we don't even know how many are guilty or innocent. This is not a court. Then the grand jury just determines that there's enough evidence to go to court. And the quote, little boys and girls, raping little boys and girls, absolutely untrue. First of all, they were not little boys and girls. Most, almost all were post-puberty. Still not right, but that's not a little boy or girl. Former Bishop Troutman, Troutman was accused by Shapiro of hiding the names from the public of the priests and not publishing them and condemned him publicly. Mr. Shapiro, you owe Bishop Troutman an apology. Why? 
because the names he hid were names that were never convicted. They were only accused, and we have no understanding whatsoever if there was guilt or not. Anybody could make any accusation. The priest deserves. Now, if he's guilty, yes. Fullest extent of the law, church law and civil law. Remove him, punish him. But these weren't even given that opportunity. The conception of these all priests had been tried and convicted. That's how Shapiro presented it. False. Troutman said, the bishop, no federal, state, or canonical law required that the names of those not convicted be made public. And he was condemned. There's a huge difference between any accusation and a proven fact. Not all accusations are true. Many are. So here, anyone accused is presumed guilty in this report. They were not given a chance to be proven their innocence because it wasn't a court case. Almost none of these accusations were verified by the grand jury. And you know how many convictions came out of it? You know how many total convictions of that entire grand jury of the entire state of Pennsylvania and all of the diocese since the 1940s, you know how many convictions came of it? One. And that was a priest that was accused of lying to police officers. Am I saying bad things didn't happen? No. I'm sure bad things happened. They have evidence bad things happened. But to throw the other priests in there, this report was investigative, not evidentiary. The report summary suggests that it was authoritative. It's not. Shapiro said that the church, quote, had disdain for the victims, but I, as a member of the church, have the right to speak up and say, if you read the reports, most bishops met with the victims after 2002. You know why 2002? because many of the cases were unknown before that. 2002 is the year the Boston Globe broke the church scandal, and then all the victims started coming forward, many, many, many victims. And that's when many of these bishops were made aware for the first time. Now, the evidence in the records show that many of these bishops met with their victims. But the PA report, Pennsylvania report, says the bishops willingly hid all abuse cases. This isn't possible. In fact, one-third of the cases were unknown. How could they have hid all of them when un one-third were unknown? Church leaders can hardly be said to have brushed aside the victims, done nothing, hid, and reassigned predators when they didn't know. Some did, absolutely, but a third were not. So that's not all. And of the two-thirds that were known, we have evidence that many of the bishops met with the victims. When the abuse did become known, the available, the available evidence, which you can look up online, indicates that the victims were sympathetically contacted and offered counseling and assistance and even retribution for the crimes that were reported to the DA. What about rape? I'm not using that word. Shapiro did. A vast, vast number of the cases were not rape. He said they were all rape. This makes me angry. This is why I go to the airport and I have people blocking me from getting on the plane, calling me a rapist pedophile because of people like Josh Shapiro who said they were all rape. No, the vast number of cases were stupid, but they were drinking, sexual talk, and viewing pornography. This is still wrong. I am not defending this. This has to be addressed. This has to be punished. But I'm sorry, drinking is not rape. Sex talk and viewing pornography is bad. It's wrong. It's demonic. But it's not rape. That's a vast majority of the cases. He said a boy had his mouth, this is Shapiro said, a young boy had his mouth washed out with holy water after being forced to perform oral sex. And I'm sorry to bring up the details, but you know what happened? 
He never corrected this. He made that false accusation and gave the name of a priest, and it was never corrected. You know what? If you do your investigation, two entirely separate investigations, one by a former FBI agent and another by officials of the Vatican, determined all claims against this priest, Father Benestad, were false. Father Benestad, we owe you an apology. Just like the victims who were raped by priests, we owe them not only apology, but anything we can do to help them. Your name has been destroyed in the opposite direction. You were innocent. And we have the head of Pennsylvania, the governor now, mentioning your name and saying you did these terrible things when it has been proven it is false. You know how it was based? You know how Shapiro got this story? 100% was based on a single email that was received into his office claiming by somebody anonymous that they just remembered it. This is what you're basing it on? An anonymous email, one email, this priest had no other charges brought against him of any kind. One anonymous email comes in says that this priest forced oral sex and made me wash my mouth with holy water, and Shapiro announces it to the world. That is horrible. Let's go to our next slide. This is Father John Fitzgerald. God bless you, Father John Fitzgerald. In 2014, the Diocese of Pittsburgh got a claim against him. The accuser was the only accuser against him, was a criminal, and said that the priest had assaulted him in a plane and at the Pittsburgh International Airport Chapel. When the accuser sat down for a 2014 interview with authorities, quote, the authorities reported his story dramatically changed and he dramatically changed his allegations. Also, the time he said he was assaulted in the Pittsburgh airport with the chapel, I'm sorry, in the chapel of the Pittsburgh airport, the chapel hadn't been built. The chapel had not even been built when he said that he was assaulted. Flight experts testified that what this accuser said happened on the plane could not have happened, and no other accusations were brought against this priest. Father Joseph Ganter, was also on the list. Born in 1892, he was accused in 2008 by an 80-year-old man for abusing him in the 1930s. In 1945, at the request of Father Ganter, a justice of the peace interviewed three teenage males who had made accusations against him. This was in the 1940s. Not only did they give conflicting stories, later the three admitted that they never were abused by Father Ganter. Sorry, Father Ganter. You were brought out by Father or by J, uh, Josh Shapiro. You were put on this list of the Pennsylvania grand jury, even though you were born in 1892 and you were innocent. So the grand jury ridicules these and has blamed. Now, I'm also going to mention something because I'm trying to show both sides here. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain there are victims on both sides. Nobody talks about the priest victims. I'm trying to give them a voice. I'm very disappointed. I think Father Mike Schmitz, who I respect, he needs to make a follow-up video to the one he has on YouTube. Because Father Mike Schmitz on YouTube is out there expressing how horrendous he was crying, how horrendous and rotten and horrible these priests are. Father Mike Schmitz, you owe these priests an apology. I'm sorry. I respect the work you do. You're a good priest. But you owe these priests an apology. There was a video out there of him. I looked everywhere else for a follow-up video saying that the evidence of this grand jury has now appeared to be grossly in error. There isn't one. So I call upon him to put out another video expressing the truth of the grand jury in Pennsylvania. This is only trying to give out the truth 
I know this is controversial. I know I'm going to get slammed. I'm not trying to defend guilty priests. I'm trying to defend innocent people, whether they are priest or laity. Innocent people. Innocent victims of guilty priests. Your story needs to be told. That's what I began this talk with. At the same time, nobody talks about the innocent priests. And that's all I'm trying to do here. The grand jury ridiculed bishops for evaluating priests as psychiatric centers. Okay, here's what's interesting. The grand jury said that these bishops um, put priests for evaluation at these psychiatric centers and then returned them into ministry. And they criticized the bishops for this, saying you knew they had problems and you put them back into ministry. The problem was the bishops were told to do that by the psychiatrists they were entrusted to give care. From the 1960s to the 1980s when this happened, almost everyone who dealt with these sexual offenses, not just in the church, relied on these same psychologists. Years ago, the bishops were instructed to seek counseling from these psychiatrists and psychologists, and they were told by them to return the priests to ministry. We have so much documentation on this. So to hold the bishop accountable today for what he was told to do in 1960, using 2023 standards, is unfair. We do not do this with doctors. We don't say, hey, doc, you replaced my knee back in 1960. How dare you not use titanium? That's not what they had. And so we have to see that this technology was different back then, and so was what the priests were told to do. Let's watch a two-minute video of the head of the Catholic League PhD, Dr. Donahue. Just two minutes as he talks about these psychiatrists that were in charge of evaluating these priests in the 60s and 70s. Let's watch this real quick. One you guys do okay? I want to focus on here rather heavily, the role of therapist. Now, again, I'm not going to exculpate or exonerate a bishop for making a bad decision, but to be fair to them, Back in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, I have a PhD in sociology. I know what I'm talking about this because I know the people involved. They thought that they could cure these psychologists, the psychoanalysts, and, uh, and, and, and psychiatrists. They could fix anybody. There wasn't any kind of malady that couldn't be fixed. And they told the bishops, you give me Father X, and we'll through, put him through five sessions over six weeks or whatever, and we're going to send him back to you, and he'll be good to go. They overrated their competence in their own elitist arrogance. They should have said, listen, some of these men are seriously disabled, and maybe the best thing to do is to get them some help and then wean them out of the priesthood. They never said that. What they said is, we can fix them all. And the bishops bought this. And uh, I think the therapists have gotten away with murder, and I think that's because a lot of the people in academia in the social sciences, they look at themselves, they say, well, we don't want to admit that we're the fair. let's put it all on the bishop. No, it's not fair. So you've got that element, but then we also have uh, the molesting uh, priest. Now, why would a man put his hands on a minor? Yep. Well, there are a lot of things that people have argued the causes for that, and it's not has nothing to do with celibacy. They had celibacy for the last thousand years as, as a normative requirement. We didn't have this problem back in the 40s and 50s, this problem exploded with the sexual revolution. And quite frankly, it was the homosexuals. 81% of all of the sexual abuse of minors that was committed by homosexuals. They weren't going after prepubescent boys, the little ones. They weren't the five-year-olds. They were the 15-year-olds. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to exonerate. I'm not trying to give somebody a pass. We're going after an adolescent, but there is a difference, and we have to understand that. The reason we have to understand it is that if you want to get rid of the problem, you better have a right diagnosis. The problem is homosexuality. Okay, so thank you for watching that. As Dr. Donahue showed, 
these psychiatrists were the ones that instructed our bishops to put the priests back into ministry. And we have to understand that not everything was done right, but that was part of the problem. Not all of it. I mean, the problem is really the priests. But how we handled it was misunderstood. Now, since 2002, the church has completely changed her way of handling abuse cases. There's very few now. Very, very few. What you hear in the media and stuff, almost all are old cases. Very few today. Yes, some are still guilty. I just gave you all the list of the current ones when we began our talk. Um, but don't leave the church because of it. The church <clears throat> is both human, like Jesus, and divine. Like Jesus in her divinity, she will never mislead you. But in her humanity, like us, she's broken. She can make mistakes. Don't quit, though. You know, I always give that example of, you know, um, a military soldier. You know, don't quit the military because of a bad general. You know, I, I said a couple of talks ago that I'm from Monroe, Michigan. And that's the home of General George Armstrong Custer who died at the little battle of the little bighorn. By all accounts, he was a bad general. He only won a victory against Indian women and children. He led his man to destruction at the little bighorn because his ego, he wanted all the pride of the victory. And he got wiped out by thousands of Sioux and Cheyenne warriors. By all accounts, he's a bad general. But I don't know any military people who has come up and said, you know what, Father Chris, I left the army because of General Custer. He was a bad general. No. We don't leave Jesus because of Judas. Yes, we've had some Judases. But we don't leave Jesus because of Judas. The 12 apostles, one betrayed Christ, one denied him. One refused to believe in the resurrection, and they all ran away at the cross. Man is weak. But the church, again, is both human and divine. In her divine nature, she'll last forever. In her human nature, she will have scandal. Pray for her. We can't accept these activities. They've got to be dealt with. For every one bad priest, statistics show there are 99 good ones. But we don't hear about them. Here's a shocker for you, and I know I'm going to get letters on this, but you know what? I'm putting it out there. Statistically, your child is safest with a Catholic priest. Go to the Jenkins study out of Penn State. Go to the John Jay report. Let's put it up on our screen. Here is what's very interesting. This is a true stat. 85% of abuse happens in the home. 14% in schools and extracurricular activities. 1% happens in religious institutions, and of that, the Catholic Church is in the bottom half. Again, one case is too many. We have a higher standard. We have a much higher standard. We can't accept this. The general population, I said before, is 4% pedophiles. Priests are 1% to 2% four times less likely is a priest to be a pedophile than the guy walking down the street. Four times. Still too many. But we got to do our part. Listen to Mary at Akita. Listen to Mary at Fatima. Do our first Fridays. Do our first Saturdays. Make reparation to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary for these sins. You know, the bride, she must resemble her betrothed. So we are in the crucifixion phase. The church is in the crucifixion phase. It hurts. But we can't expect to be resurrected without going through Good Friday. So in a way, the scandal really did need to happen. It really did. Uh, like a cut, if your wound is not exposed to the air, it'll never heal. This wound, this scar, need, or this wound needed to be exposed to the air. And only that way can it be stopped. Only in this way can it be fixed. We are being purified. But the problem is, people think this is just a Catholic problem. 
It is wrong anywhere, but it's not just a Catholic problem. It's a broken humanity problem. People don't know this. What I'm about to share with you, I bet you've never learned. Let's start with Dr. Philip Jenkins, or Philip Jenkins. He, he published Myth of a Catholic Crisis that appeared in the American Conservative in June of 2010. He said, are Catholic priests the biggest abusers? Unfortunately, we have not the slightest idea. We don't have the slightest point of comparison with any other group. As a result the fear of the furious investigations of the past decades in the Catholic Church, particularly the John Jay study, the U.S. Catholic clergy are now the only major group on the planet that has ever been subjected to a, such a detailed examination of abuse complaints using internal evidence, the church itself, that could not have come in light to light in any other way. Nothing vaguely comparable exists for any other group, for Presbyterian pastors, for Lutheran clergy, or Jewish rabbis, or indeed, even laity. Philip Jenkins, who was the religious teacher and doctor at Penn State, also wrote Forum, the myth of the pedophile priest that appeared in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette after the scandal broke with the Boston Globe. Let's show the screen. Let's put it up on his quote on the screen. This is Philip Jenkins, PhD. My research, quote, of cases over the past 20 years indicates no evidence that the Catholic or other celibate clergy are any more likely to be involved in misconduct or abuse than clergy of any other denomination, or indeed, than non-clergy. However, determined news media may see this affair as a crisis of celibacy. But the charge is unsupported. Literally every denomination and faith tradition has its share of abuse cases, and some of the worst involve non-Catholics. Again, am I trying to excuse the Catholic Church? No. Just trying to show some light that I don't think you've ever heard. He goes on to say, every mainline Protestant denomination has had scandals as have Pentecostals, Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, Jews, Buddhists, and even Hare Krishnas. One Canadian Anglican diocese is on the verge of bankruptcy as a result of massive lawsuits caused by decades of systematic abuse. Yet the Anglican Church does not demand celibacy of its clergy. So it's not celibacy. However much it contradicts conventional wisdom the pedophile priest, quote unquote, is not a Catholic specialty. How many times have you ever heard a pedophile rabbi, a pedophile pastor? It's always a pedophile priest. But yet this PhD says completely otherwise. Now let's go to Pat Wingert, who published in Newsweek, of all places in 2010, priests commit no more abuse than any other males. Here's what he said. No formal comparative study has ever broken down child sexual abuse by denomination, and only the Catholic Church has released data of its own. But based on the survey, so, so basically we are condemned for the data, which is, is, is right, we should be, but we're the only ones supplying it. You see the point there. But based on the surveys and studies conducted by different denominations over the past 30 years, experts who study child abuse say that they see little reason to conclude that sexual abuse is mostly a Catholic issue. Quote, this is Pat Wingert, we don't see the Catholic Church as a hotbed of this or a place that has a bigger problem than anyone else. This was from Ernie Allen, I apologize. That was a quote from Ernie Allen, the president of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Ernie Allen said, quote, I can tell you without hesitation that we have seen cases in many religious settings, from traveling evangelists to mainstream ministers to rabbis and others, not just Catholic priests. 
Since the mid-1980s, here's something very interesting. Insurance companies have offered sexual misconduct coverage as a rider in their insurance liability. And their own studies indicate that the Catholic churches are not higher risk than any other congregations. Insurance companies that cover all denominations, such as, people always ask me, what are your sources? Here we go. The Guide One Center for Risk Management manages over 40,000 churches, and they do not charge Catholic churches higher premiums. Why? Quote from Sarah Buckley, the Assistant Vice President of Corporate Communications. She said, quote, we don't see vast differences in the incident rate between one denomination or another. It's pretty even across the denominations. It's been that way for decades. Again, still wrong. How do we eliminate this? How do we stop it? Trent Horn had an article on Catholic Answers, are Catholic priests more likely to abuse than other authority figures? And he said, because the organizational structure we see in the Catholic Church is absent in most Protestant churches, it's more difficult for outside groups to determine how often sexual abuse claims are made in other churches and how often they get swept under the rug. In fact, the John Jay Report, a detailed study of sex abuse of Catholic clergy, suggests that the number of Catholic cases is lower than other religions. In 2004, a report from the U.S. Department of Education indicated that one out of 10 public school students experience unwanted sexual advance from an educator. One in 10. That's 10 times the amount at least five times the amount of a Catholic priest. According to the report's author, quote, more than 4.5 million students are subject to sexual misconduct by an employee or teacher of a school sometime between kindergarten and the 12th grade. And your child spends a lot more time at school than at church. This is where we need help as well. Why then does the public still associate priests with sexual abuse and not public school teachers? who may be in the present moment more likely to abuse children? Well, since the one-third of those who were abused between 1960 and 1980, they waited to report the crime until 2002. These reports then opened up the door for things like the grand jury. Well, in the schools, they only have 90 days. But nobody's attacking the schools. You only give 90 days to report? This is in many states. The Pennsylvania is treated as though the incidents they cover, although most cases are from 1960 to 1980, they're making the news now, makes it sound like it's a current problem. The current numbers are way, way, way down, praise be to God. Catholic clergy sex abuse dropped dramatically after 2002. That's when the Boston Globe broke it. You know why? because the USCCB instituted mandatory reporting guidelines in Catholic dioceses and enacted safe environment policies. I deal with them every day. I am speaking from knowledge here because I deal with these every day. Our priests, we have to get fingerprinted. We have to do background checks. This is good. This is how it should be. They prohibited adults the USCCB from being alone with minors except in approved situations. We are prudent. I love little kids, but it's not prudent for me to take one alone in a car to go get an ice cream cone. Used to be, but unfortunately not today. I can't and will not do that. Now, we should continue to implement these policies and make sure that they get applied to all Catholics, bishops and other leaders in our church. Even non-Catholics should do this. The USCCB has the strongest guidelines of any institution on in how to deal with minors. This is beautiful. Let's go to our next slide. This is another quote. This is religion reporter David Gibson, who originally started out to crucify the church, and here's what he said. Quote, the Catholic Church may be the safest place for children. Wow. 
whatever its past record, the Catholic Church in the United States has made unparalleled strides in educating their flock about child abuse, child sexual abuse, and ensuring that children are safe in Catholic environments. Wow. You don't hear that too often. So I want to finish with a couple stories. I was just in Australia, and I'm going to be going back. And I mentioned that case it's all over the news, and I really respect this man. George Weigel wrote a whole bunch about this, the conviction of Cardinal Pell. Now, this is interesting. Let's go to our next slide. This is a picture of Cardinal Pell. He's the former Catholic Archbishop of Melbourne and Sydney in Australia. Later, he became the Vatican's chief financial officer. And he was convicted of abuse in one of the most highest profile cases ever. The Cardinal's first trial was a hung jury. Ten in favor of innocent, two said he was guilty. So they call that a hung jury. You have to have unanimous in a criminal case. So they had to retry it. And the defense, again, demonstrated that it was impossible for the Cardinal to abuse the two choir boys that claimed he did at the time he did, given the layout and the security arrangements of Melbourne's Catholic Cathedral, where they said it happened. And in fact, all right, and the fact that the choir and Father Pell were in two different places when the abuse was alleged to have occurred. So they said the abuse happened in the choir and Father Pell was able to prove he wasn't even there. So it was proved that Cardinal Pell was always surrounded by others at the cathedral on that day in 1996. So why the Melbourne police never investigated these facts is a mystery. So then they did a retrial. Let's show a picture here. That is what our clergy in some cases are, are facing. Look at the devil horns put on him, 666, calling him Satan. The retrial took days to reach a verdict, and they convicted him. They convicted him, which was upheld two to one in an appellate court. But the case, when it was tried, the Crown prosecutors produced no evidence that the alleged crimes had ever been committed, basing their argument solely on a single testimony with no evidence of one of the victims. It was inconsistent with the other victim, and consistent with himself over time, it was shown to be flawed. There was no physical evidence and there were no witnesses to corroborate the charges. Now, they told me when I was in Australia that anti-Catholicism is really severe, and it's been that way for a few decades now, including the media. So Father Pell, when you look at him, he actually, before the trial, before any accusation, set up Australia's first process for investigating and compensating clerical abuse victims. Then finally, a unanimous decision, it went all the way to Australia's highest court, overturned everything. Overturned everything. There was no evidence. And so my point here is that not every Catholic priest is a pedophile. Please, you can trust your church. And if you are aware of true abuse, please report it. It does happen. Nobody's denying that. What about John Paul II? There's an article in Catholic Answers that John Paul knew of priestly sexual abuse. How did he become a saint? Yeah, this is a problem. Let's go to our next slide. This is people protesting the Pope. Now, the fact is, we don't know when John Paul became aware of the problem of priests. We don't know. Now, the person most directly responsible for priests is his bishop in the diocese or the provincial superior of a religious community. I can promise you, if any case is ever brought to me about one of our Marian priests, it will be dealt with. But he will also be innocent until proven guilty. And we want to listen to all sides. If he's proven guilty, then yes, 
He must be addressed. And he will be. Now, John Paul, this is interesting here, if the superior does not report the problem to the Vatican, the Pope really isn't going to know. And a lot of these were not reported. So after the 2002 Boston Globe report, we knew that John Paul knew there was a problem. So all those accusing John Paul that he knew to some extent is true, but you know what he did after he found out? He put Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, our prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, in charge of expediting and laicizing abusive priests and reforming church law so that the bishops were held responsible for failure to act appropriately to abuse cases. Now, I think one of the criticisms might be is that John Paul waited too long. And that might be true. As for how he could be canonized, two things. One, his cause was investigated by the Congregation for the Causes of the Saints, so they knew of his record of the abuse scandal, and it would have been scrutinized. But second, failures of prudence do not necessarily impede a person from being named a saint. We can all make mistakes. And if he waited a little bit too long, that was a mistake, but he did put together that commission. Saints are to be considered perfect in their earthly lives to the extent that they, what they did on this earth is considered right, just, and necessary for Catholics to imitate in your own life. But holiness is not synonymous with perfection. You could be holy, but still make mistakes. To be holy just means set apart to God, for God. The holy person accepts the call to give their life to God, but he may make mistakes. He's got to be open to correction, and John Paul was. He apologized. He may sin, but he always repents and seeks reconciliation. We imitate his virtues, but we don't necessarily mimic his actions. I'm not talking just John Paul, but anybody. All right, I'd like to finish because I was a Boy Scout. I'd like you to pray for the Boy Scouts. I had no idea. You know why? Because I don't hear about this like I do the Catholic priests. The Boy Scouts of America, I'm going to reference a study done by the LA Times, of all people, in 2020, November. The Boy Scouts of America are now facing 100,000 claims of sexual abuse. The Catholic Church is 17,000. Still, way too many. Actually, 92,700 claims, which now is over 100,000. The number of claims of the total payouts to settle these cases for the Boy Scouts, will, the lawyers have said, will easily eclipse those of the sexual abuse scandal in the U.S. Catholic Church. It'll be way, way, way more than it already is. At the time of their bankruptcy, because you know the Boy Scouts went bankrupt, the national organization had asset, assets of more than a billion. Local Boy Scout councils separately hold billions more in real estate and other assets. Kind of sounds like the Catholic Church, right? This um, L.A. attorney that was um, involved in the scouting case named Monis, Monis, he said the scouts pay out and he was representing the victims against the scouts. He said, the Boy Scouts payouts will dwarf those made by the Catholic Church, including the Archdiocese of LA when they settled a $600 million suit for 500 victims. Bottom line is this is a mess, but not just a Catholic mess. Last segment, lawsuits against the Scouts have now numbered into the 100,000. 100, but the organization has never disclosed 
how often it has been sued or how much it has paid out yet exactly. The lawyers keep saying it'll be more than the Catholic Church. Many of the lawsuits come in the wake of the LA Times publication that internal scout records involving 5,000 men were on a blacklist known as perversion files. There were closely guarded documents that detailed sexual abuse allegations against troop leaders. Does this sound any different? This is exactly what happened in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church should be condemned for it. But why isn't anybody else? We all should be called to task. The Times documented hundreds of cases in which the Boy Scouts failed to report accusations to authorities, hid the allegations from parents and the public, and urged admitted abusers to quietly resign, and then helped cover their tracks with bogus reasons for their departures. This comes from the attorneys. Accusers cited the files as evidence that they knew of pedophiles but failed to protect the children. Monas, the lawyer, and others have instituted, have insisted, I'm sorry, that the files reflect only a fraction of the actual abuse that has occurred. Almost 100,000 alleged victims of these sexual abuse within the Boy Scouts have come forward now to claim the abuse. This is according to the BBC in 2020. A lawyer for the plaintiffs called it the biggest ever U.S. sexual abuse case. But you know what's interesting? They polled, it wasn't a big poll. I was reading, they polled like 500 people. And they said, what institutions are you aware of that have the biggest sexual abuse case? And 97% said the Catholic Church. All I'm trying to do is shed some light that it's not just a Catholic problem. We need to pray. The, the BS, the Boy Scouts has apologized to victims saying it's been, it's devastated. Devastated, this is terrible. Schools, Boy Scouts and the Catholic Church. If your child cannot be safe at those three places, where can they be safe? Family is the biggest. If they can't be safe in your own family, that's the biggest of all. 85% of abuse happens in the home. Lord, have mercy on us. But I finished because over the past two years, there's been almost no allegations credible. Only 0.005% of Catholic clergy have had a credible accusation against them. 0.005% in the last two years. Nobody knows what the figure is for other institutions because they don't keep the records. They don't dismiss them, dismiss them. But why hasn't there been a grand jury for the Boy Scouts? Why hasn't there been a grand jury for the public schools? There's only been against the Catholic Church. I know you all are going to argue and hate me for this talk. I'm just trying to give the truth. Well, Father, you didn't say that the church is guilty. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Nobody is debating that the Catholic Church isn't guilty, but not to the degree that we've been told or not to the degree that it's only the Catholic Church. When 97% of the public believe that this is only a Catholic problem, the Catholic Church needs to stand up and say, yeah, we've had problems. We are so very sorry. But you know what we're doing now? We got processes and things in place like the Dallas Charter, like protecting God's children, like Virtus training, like strict USCCB guidelines. 0.005% of priests in the last two years had credible allegations. Progress is being made, praise be to God. And so I ask for your prayers this is, no one knows exactly, as I said, what the other sing, uh, institutions are. To single out the Catholic Church without ever investigating any other institution is wrong. Let's look at our last slide. Right there, the slide. Catholic Church, stop the child abuse. That should say mankind, stop the child abuse. Yes, in the church too. So why is the Catholic Church the one that gets all the negative publicity? Why? There are many vicious critics of the Catholic Church 
who would like to weaken our moral authority and will focus on any problems we have to discredit the church. Why? Simple. They hate our teaching on sexuality, marriage, and family. Oh, Father, you're just sitting up there being a victim. No, praise be to God, I'm not a victim yet. Could be a victim of false accusation at any time. But I empathize with the true victims, but I know also that there are victim priests. There's one, like I said, in jail just north of us that refuses to admit his guilt because he didn't do anything, and he's sitting in jail. And so we need to pray. The reason the church is targeted is because of our teaching on sexuality, marriage, and the family. However, this does not excuse even a single case of abuse. And it certainly doesn't allow to hide them. I haven't stressed that enough here. Abuse is bad enough. That's horrid. But to hide it? Unconscionable. So how do we protect it? This is where I want to finish. What can we do? You can report if you see anything. Okay? You can... You can, you can Take action. Don't let anything happen to a child. The church and the Marian fathers have really stepped up on child protection commitment. The church in 2002 issued the Dallas Charter mandating the reporting of all allegations to public authorities like the police cooperating in investigations and advising victims of their rights. Now, the Dallas Charter has worked, but not perfectly. We priests are now guilty until proven innocent. But if that's the price we got to pay for the sins of the past, okay. And I finish with our last slide. That's the Marian Fathers. That's our crest. And you know, the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception, which I'm now the provincial superior, we recognize that the sexual abuse of children has devastating consequences for children, the victims, their survivors, and their families. We will help you. Please contact me if you've ever had an issue with a Marian priest. We are aware of the effects of this tragic behavior and are committed to protecting God's children, all people, who are affected by abuse. The main programs we use are Virtus and Protecting God's Children, and we have a commitment to helping those affected, I can promise you. The Marians have responded to all of our allegations of sexual misconduct with great care. We will handle each instance, I promise you, promptly, thoroughly, and compassionately. I promise. And we will provide assistance, including any psychological counseling and convictions, if needed, of a priest for those affected by sexual misconduct. We, as Marians, have a self-environment coordinator together with the members of an independent review board that we will promptly investigate any accusation of sexual misconduct by a Marian. All allegations of child sexual abuse I reported to the civil authorities. You have my word. But praise be to God. Do you know how many current Marians we have that are currently accused, either credibly or not credibly? You know how many current Marians we have? Zero. Praise be to God. So we ask you to keep praying for us that we can continue now, we've had mistakes of the past. We've had some cases of the past. I'm not going to sugarcoat that. The grand jury is going back on priests 60 years ago. Have we Marians made mistakes? Yes. But right now, currently, of my active priests and brothers in this congregation, there's none with an active sexual child abuse. And I should say that. There's complaints. We have complaints but we do not have one active child pedophilia accusation, praise be to God. 
And so we want to give glory to God for his grace and helping us in our ministry. And as I finish, to you, first of all, for listening. This is not an easy topic. This is a very difficult topic. But I'll be honest with you, it's one I feel is long overdue. Just as it is horrendously horrible to allow a victim to be a victim, it is also not right to allow a priest to be falsely accused. We need God's mercy because we are broken. And we ask all of you to help the church by praying for her, praying for the victims first, but also praying for the perpetrators. As I said earlier, their souls are in jeopardy. We all make mistakes, but one with a child is on a different level. And so God bless you. Thank you for joining us. And remember, please report anything that you find or see or hear about as an abuse, because slowly, slowly but surely, we are making progress. God bless you. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And before we go, we got one minute left. I'd like Brother Mark to put up on the screen. Uh, join us, Marians, as our family in the micprayers.org. This is um, our Marian Helpers Association, the Association of Marian Helpers, that we pray together. We stand together. We help each other. There's no cost. There's no, um, there's no minimum donation or nothing like that. It only takes a couple seconds to enroll. Join us and just become part of our family. All it is, you pray for us, we pray for you. And you get a lot of spiritual benefits of grace when you're a Marian helper by, by really decree of the Holy See. So God bless everybody. Thank you for coming and we'll see you. Um, I'm not sure next week. No, I'll be in Rome. We'll make the announcements on the next talk. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Hell, too, is divided into various and countless circles. The lower the circle, the heavier the torment. The condemned soul knows about all the greatness, the power, and the beauty of God, and is also aware that it will never see Him. It knows that its suffering is eternal, and that nothing can soothe or alleviate it. It is burned by an endless fire of desire and longing for happiness that will never again be experienced. And this fire devours and digests the condemned soul, but never destroys it completely. The condemned soul has a full understanding of its own loss and of the righteousness of the punishment it suffers. It cannot love God, though it knows of his power and perfection. It cannot feel either repentance or regret, because these feelings would relieve the souls and give the impression that it is paying off a debt to God given by his love. However, only negative feelings are available. Despair, pain, weakness, abandonment, and most of all, constant unlimited hate for oneself and for everything. Whoever consciously rejected God during his lifetime will be rejected by him after death. The soul will go into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and grinding of teeth.